Aloha, and welcome to the second episode of World of Books. I'm your host, Mihaila Stoops, and I'm streaming live from my home in Honolulu, Maui. I love reading books, and I love talking about them, and I hope that this discussion today is going to help you choose your next read. Today's book is Zuleika by Guzel Yakina, who is a contemporary Russian author that has received very many literary awards and a lot of international recognition. And my guest is my friend, Katya Newton. Katya has lived in the islands for about 11 years. Uh, she lives in West Maui, actually. She has a very su successful career as a CPA and she runs the Maui Prep Book Club. Uh, I think that's how we met, actually. Last but not least, Katya is of Russian descent. She immigrated to US when she was in high school. Katya, thank you so much for joining me today for this discussion. I'm very happy to be here and I enjoyed the book. Okay, that's what I was about to start with. How did you like it? You know, I connected with the book a lot, probably also because I'm from Eastern Europe, but um, you might have looked at it with different eyes than any other reader. Um, yeah, you know, I should have read it in Russian, but I didn't realize at first. Uh, that was originally written in Russian because, you know, could be the author's name could be several Eastern European nationalities. So I started listening in English, but uh, maybe I should go and reread it in Russian. But yeah, it was extremely interesting. I think every family who originated in Russia has, you know, relatives who went through that period uh, of time. My grandmother was born not too far from Kazan. She was from Nizhny Novgorod, which also is a southern Russia, kind of close to the land. She was born in 1927, and her parents uh, were, you know, moved from the original spot. And so I had heard a lot of stories about that. So I read the book in Romanian because it was gifted to me by one of my Romanian friends, Gabby. And uh, I had to read the book again prior to our show, to prepare for the show. And I realized that the title of the book in Romanian was different than the English version. The, in Romanian, it was translated as Zuleika opens her eyes. And this sentence is repeated in the book four times at key moments in Zuleika's um, life. So um, I guess let's introduce the audience to what Zuleika opens her eyes to. And you kind of hinted to the um, time frame, and you also kind of hinted to the location. Um, how, I mean, it's, she's a young Tatar woman. I should mention this for, for the viewers. Are you familiar with that area of Russia and um, uh, yeah. that ethnic group? Yeah, it's actually, I think it's now Zuleika, like with how the Tatars say it. And so it's uh, Zuleika instead of Zuleika. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, Russia has a lot of Muslim population. So um, she's been going through a difficult period of time where she was, you know, um, part of the revolution and the change of regime over there, but she was also a woman. She was also a Muslim woman. And that puts like three more difficult layers on her, on her life at the time. So, which you could probably tell from the opening of the book, her living conditions were not exactly ideal. Yeah. So the book starts with, you know, basically Zuleika and her husband, are putting away food and grains because the Soviets are out and about and they are confiscating all the farm animals, houses, lands, and uh, grains and so on. Um, under this process of decolacization, probably one of the most difficult words to pronounce in this book, along with collectivization. And yeah. um, that's, that's how it starts. And basically the two of them particularly the husband, he opposes the whole process and he doesn't want to join the collective. And as a result, uh, he is executed on the spot and she's sent to the gulag. Right. Yeah, so that, that happened a lot. Um, you know, people who had a little more um, items to donate, they were visited and the call calls organizations or collective farm organizations were um, kind of put together and. A lot of people did not want to donate their private property, but uh, that's how they kind of 
try to organize the farming. You know, it's a difficult time. There's famine everywhere across the region. And some of those collective farms were successful, but some, of course, were not. So I guess it's just dependent on the project management skills of whoever was running them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, people hid stuff everywhere. And I think they were, um, you know, they butchered that cow and they were trying to hide it, the meat in the forest. And upon return, since they didn't bring the wood back, it seemed to be very suspicious to the soldiers why they were, you know, wandering around the woods without actually any purpose. And yeah, and so I think that's when her husband gets murdered. But it turned out yeah. to be actually, actually kind of an interesting turn of events for Zuleha because, you know, it completely changed, changed her life and kind of put it on a different course um, that she could, you know, it wouldn't be the same if that episode didn't happen. She's definitely a strong woman to have gone through all of this. And um, she ends up in the Gulag at winter comes. This is in Siberia. Um, okay. Some of you may know that approximately 700,000 people were sent by Stalin to the Gulag. And a lot of them just died because of the super harsh conditions. So um, if there's anybody out there that likes survival stories, well, <laughs> this book has it as well. So, right, and even just the, um, you know, the journey there is, is, was very uh, difficult as well. So just uh, not very many people, or actually a lot of people did make it there, but a lot perished during the journey because it's a really large country. And, you know, travel by boat, travel, well, by train first, they traveled them by boat. And um, in overpacked cars and overpacked boats and, um, I think it happens to a lot of migrants, even during our times, where they, they die even without getting to their destination. So, you know, in my um, years when I could still listen to my grandparents' stories, they kept on telling me about the people that were sent to the Gula. And I think because of the fact that a lot of this was developing behind the Iron Curtain, these stories were not really known to the West or to the world. It was not good PR, obviously, to tell what was happening to the, in the gulags, and it was proof that the system didn't work. Did you as well grow up hearing these stories and um, knowing people maybe? Yeah, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't know anybody whose family was sent there, but maybe that's because, you know, I grew up in Novgorod, which is um, kind of close to St. Petersburg, to Finland border. Uh, most people who were sent to the Gulag eventually moved, but they didn't move that far west. So that'd be more in central Russia. So in my region, you know, whoever stayed there, stayed there, they weren't sent anywhere. And, you know, uh, Russians don't like to move around very much. There are a lot of times families, generations stay in the same area. So, um, yeah, I didn't personally know anybody uh, who went through that. I did, you know, like I said, my, my grandmother was telling me stories about her mom when they were relocated and they had, you know, some livestock and the cows, um, they took the cows and their horse and the cows apparently uh, that went to the collective farm survived, but the horse, um, my grandmother really liked that horse as a child and was attached to it. And she said it was so sad because they couldn't take care of the horse and they would come and visit it and bring it food, but eventually it died because they couldn't, you know, the collective farm wasn't taking as good care of it as they were. So, so I kind of, uh, from a personal perspective, I'm familiar with the decolocalization. Is that how you say it in English? I don't know if that word meant to be translated. Do you? I know. It's like, there's got to be a better word, but I don't it's know what more, that I mean, is. It basically means nationalization of private property. Uh, and right. It's, 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 a, it's like a Russian word that has to do with like opening up a fist, opening up a closed hand that supposedly is holding something that others want. Um, yeah. So that part I was familiar with. The other part, I don't really know anybody who um, went to Siberia. But I've been to Siberia before. It's not not, not ideal living conditions for sure. That's what <laughs> not 
so. Well, the book seemed very, very authentic to me because of the description of the places and the stories and the characters. And I felt like it's, um, it's a capsule of the Russian society at the time uh, through those people that, those characters that were part of the gulag. You had the, the two commanders that, communist commanders that would do anything to preserve their positions. And they just follow orders with no humanity, no reasoning. You right. have the, right, you, you have the uh, doctor that cannot practice anymore. He's sent to the gulag as well. And then he essentially helps all of them and becomes the healer of the area that everybody's coming to see. Um, the, the painter for me is, quite a guy, one of my favorite stories in the book is when he is asked to paint a mural and mm -hmm. he, a portion of the mural is actually um, very detailed streets of Paris with restaurants and people and the same. And when the, the commanders come in and, and look at the, the mural is revealed, he tells them that these scenes are from Moscow. And Oh, by the way, there's also the Eiffel Tower that's painted. And he tells them that, that this is like the commissariat of heavy industry, whatever. And these commanders, they don't know any better. They're in a remote part of, um, of USSR. They've never made it to, to Moscow. So they believe it if they're given enough details. And there's so many stories of these situations where intelligent people figure it out that you can't take that intelligence from them. Right. You should have said it was the streets of St. Petersburg because St. Petersburg looks more like Paris than Moscow does. But that was just, that was his mistake. I would have said that. But yeah, um, the, the commanders coming from a small, you know, Siberian town, whatever their assignment. I think uh, it, it's important to remember that they themselves, you know, if something goes wrong, um, at their location and they're not capable of, you know, getting people to, you know, improve themselves through labor, because that's what they're for. Um, you have, you, they collected them and now it's the punishment uh, is, they, you know, they didn't believe in them to stay in jail. They're like, well, how do we improve you? We have to improve you through hard labor because that's how you become better. So if something went wrong at their location, that would be probably executed very, probably more quickly than, than their prisoner. So uh, I can certainly, I've seen a lot of parts of the book where they kind of describe their mood and they're kind of trying to pay attention to what's going on because it was also, um, you know, going on during um, the, the, the Stalin repressions where not only like farmers, I mean, I guess the doctor would be one of the examples, but really it's a part of the upper class in educated people were, you know, um, sent to the gulag. That's the best case scenario. And a lot of times they would be just killed. So actually making it to the gulag for a lot of people was, you know, not, not such bad of an option. Yeah, and it's interesting, this re-education process to, you know, teach these people to give up, I guess, their political views and believe in socialism and communism. And one way of doing it was this agitational art. I've never heard that term before. I realize I've lived with it in um, hindsight, um, the term was coined by the Soviets and it basically described, um, I wouldn't call it art, it would be something that would entice people to believe in certain issues like communism, social, socialism, collectivization and so on. And they were just very basic posters of, I don't know, Stalin is our dear father. That's a typical one that I've seen in Romania. Or, you know, it's good to eat fish uh, because there was no meat to eat, actually, or eat soy, that kind of stupid stuff. But that, that was art, in their opinion. I'm sure you've seen your share of it as well. Yeah, I mean, it's primitive art. It's actually, I mean, it, you know, have you ever seen like pinup art or in American culture, like pinup girls? I haven't, no. Yeah, yeah, you have it. Like it, that was a popular uh, thing in America too. Actually, during World War II, if you see like, uh, you know, I don't know Sailor Jerry tattoos and they 
have like you know pictures of like roses and a cute girl, you know, a sailor. Like it was, it was. I think it was. I think that's where a Russian took it. Actually, I probably took it from America. Like that reminds me, oh. like of kind of pinup posters in America, except they have nothing to do with politics. Maybe they did at that time. I don't know. Although obviously they completely expanded it. But yeah, something that you can do something very quickly and it catches your eye. Um, it certainly doesn't need a lot of uh, evaluation. It's very clear from the poster that doesn't require a lot of analysis of what it needs to deliver. Um, yeah, and it was everywhere. Actually, I don't know. It's, uh, I have a lot of friends uh, in America and New York who collect it now and they think it's the best thing ever. Well, and I think it was called agitational art because it was supposed to agitate the mind and inspire people to exchange ideas. But of course, all these ideas were centered on how great communism is. You know, it wasn't to agitate the mind to oppose it, but to support it. Right. Yeah, it's definitely propaganda material for sure. Yeah, that, that's the best word actually, propaganda. Yeah. The um, one thing that seems to be recurring in this book is this conflict between love and duty. And this is Zuleika's story, but Ignato, the um, commander that essentially is responsible for these hundreds of people to be sent to Siberia, and then he's responsible for them once they set up camp, Obviously, in the process, he follows his orders and he does what he's supposed to do. But in the end, he does show some humanity. And, um, you know, he's the one that goes out and hunts for all of them and it helps them survive the long winters. He's the one that, uh, in the end, uh, put his name on Zuleika's son's birth certificate so he can escape from the camp. Right. So I, I keep wondering. If he has atoned for his sins, did he do enough to compensate for all the bad that he did? What do you think? Or no, he's just a bad guy and that's it. Um, I don't know. I mean, he was just playing a role. I don't know how he could be a good guy in his shoes. Um, you know, sometimes it's just that's what the cards are on the table. I mean, obviously, um, you could have done something differently at the camp, but that's how they were run. And in the end, I think he does prove himself to be a better person than we originally saw him in the beginning of the book. But it's, uh, I think it's hard. Like I never judge people in those kind of situations because they're just part of that system. And if they don't do what they're supposed to do, I mean, they have no other choice a lot of times. Which is the scary part about creating those kind of systems because then individuals have a very hard time fighting them. Like you have, you cannot have that kind of process in place because there's just not one individual is nobody. Have there been any um, not public punishment, but something similar in the USSR after the fall of communism for these people that may have truly committed, you know, crimes by executing others and sentencing them to death? Or Not that I'm aware of. of. No, because we never had like, you know, had like had the Nuremberg, uh, you know, uh, court, you know, over the Nazi Germany. I don't think Russia ever prosecuted their own people uh, for any of the crimes. And um, yeah. I don't, I don't think so. And Stalin arguably killed more, more of his own population than Hitler did. But I don't think anybody, you know, ever was prosecuted for that. And it's going on right now. I mean, how many people are dying? How many thousands of people dying daily? And I don't think, I don't know if ever if anybody will be, you know, responsible for it at that level because it's just gonna eventually come to the negotiation table and it's going to be brushed under the carpet and be like, okay, well, we're on to the new new day today, so. Well, you know, I can see why they couldn't do it before because it, the whole system was a continuation of what Stalin had set up. So you couldn't now say, okay, this was wrong. He did something wrong. On the contrary, you had to stay with the... Yeah. 
well, you know, I, yeah, I can tell you the court system in Russia doesn't work very well, you know, in general, but in particular when it involves uh, a really large scale scenario. Uh, so yeah, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I have no good expectations for that. So why did you like this book? What, what did you find? interesting about it you're obviously more uh, familiar with a lot of the issues what uh, what did you like about it i like the narrative because it was from kind of from uh Zulie's point of view and and she you know she just uh appeared to be a, a person with a good sense of humor and her observations and just little comments i just like the person because you can see the historical events through just the story of a young woman that's always interesting. Yeah, you know, when I'm trying to describe this book, it sounds like, oh yeah, that's terribly sad. This happened, her husband gets killed and she goes to the gulag and she's trying to survive and her son wants to leave her there and right. go on with his life. But there are all these like little moments of victory and uh, you're right, there's her sarcasm. They translate come in the book so, uh, clearly that it, it, it makes it's a fun book to read actually yeah I agree it's, it's pretty entertaining I liked her description of different people starting with her mother-in-law in the beginning of the book <laughs> right right and I just like you I love love the writing it feels like the classic Russian novel but it's written by somebody that's or a so that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree. I enjoyed it as well. I would recommend it. Well, um, Katya, thank you so, so much for joining me today. This was a wonderful discussion. And I hope our readers are going to go and read the book. It's totally worth it. Right. And very for our, thank you, Katya. Uh, for our next episode, we're kind of staying in the same region, and we're going to discuss the book, um, The Spy and the Traitor, and, um, by Ben McIntyre. And this is the most extravagant spy story. It's a true story, and it takes place during the Cold War. So join me, I think it's July 13th at the same time, 3 p.m., to talk about spycraft. Until then, read, 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 read it all. Ahoy ho! Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.